Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming on this rainy day. It's a while in another 40 days of rain. Anyway, it's really a pleasure today to introduce my great friend here and I've known for oh, many years. How many years? This is 1985 on Joel Dimsdale. Um, Joel Dimsdale and I were both at San Diego at the same time. We arrived at San Diego in San Diego in 1985. Joel is um, really a, 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 a wonderful psychiatrist, consultation, um, a liaison psychiatrist, and also a mentor. Uh, he obtained his uh, BA degree from Carleton College and then went on to Stanford uh, for medical training. Uh, and, uh, and then ultimately ended up in, in, in Mass General. Uh, there he was in 1976 and 1985, and then he came to San Diego. And he was the head of the consultation liaison service at San Diego, and really interacted with the residents, and also run a very robust uh, research program looking at cardiovascular risk factors and the role of psychological stress and cardiovascular risk. Uh, I had such many opportunities to work with him. But I think that we were sort of talking about today was really he shared his sort of wisdom about so many things with me. And he was also a leader and continues to be a leader in the American Psychosomatic Society. And served as an editor in chief of Psychosomatic Commission for many years. And I had the privilege of really working with him very closely during that period of time as an associate editor for psychosomatic medicine, and watch how he could dominate really competing reviews to make decisions on very difficult papers, and really could do so by advancing the field in many ways. Um, he has you know, a prolific career. Uh, I asked him to give me a short bio because his CV is just so long and extensive. Um, in addition to that, he served uh, as a consultant for the President's Commission on Mental Health for the Institute of Medicine, the National Academies of Science, NASA, and also NIH. But later on, after I came to UCLA, I also told invited me to participate in the DSM-5 working group. <laughs> I laughed because it was really a lot of work. That's <laughs> 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 wow, the sort of experience. But he ran, he dared that committee with such and what they get such wisdom and such ability to listen to disparate opinions and integrate that and reach balanced synthesis of that information so that we probably have a DSM violence now form disorder. Um, you know, he's brought such an incredible record of service to the of California, first at the University of California, San Diego. And I look on him so many things that we did at the at the Senate level at the University of California, San Diego. But because, once again, he's able to listen, he's integrated, he's able to think about a lot of issues. He's also served as the region's uh, health, uh, and on the region's health and uh, services uh, committee for the uh, University of California. And I just recently <coughs> stepped down from that position. So we really have a treat today. This is this other phase of life. Oh, I was talking with him over dinner last night. I discovered one more thing. He's gotten his largest grant ever after he retired. <laughs> uh, what is it to do? It's mentoring young faculty, oh, yes. young clinical faculty. And I think that's really a testament to how his vision of psychiatry and psychosomatic medicine in particular will be carried forward in the next generation. So we get to hear anatomy of anatomy of malice. I was in anatomy of illness because I'm <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, Michael. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I see some uh, other old friends uh, in the audience, and thank you for coming. Um, I was last in this room 40 years ago, um, uh, before it had the afternoon of Jolly West Conference Room. And, uh, I knew Jolly ever so briefly, uh, and actually spent yesterday in the UCLA archives going through some of his uh, papers. And uh, uh, in preparation for my next book, but 
I'd like to talk with you today about an aspect of research. I've spent my life doing clinical research, uh, taking care of patients at the bedside. And as researchers, we tend to get uh, focused uh, on smaller issues. But I think research ultimately always involves large issues and sometimes enduring questions. So I would like to talk with you this morning about an event that happened many, many, many years ago. But uh, as Faulkner said, the past is not dead, the past is not even the past. So these sorts of horrific life events continue. Uh, so the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal riveted the attention of the world. Uh, and everyone in the world wondered with questions about the nature of humanity uh, and the essence of malice. What drives people? That's a question that we are uh, similarly preoccupied with uh, today. I'd like to discuss this in the context of two investigators who were there at Nuremberg whose lives were so deeply intertwined with the prisoners. One was a psychiatrist and one was a psychologist. Probably, chances are, none of you have heard of either of them because their work has been closeted away. So certainly the Nazi hierarchy constituted the essence of malice. Um, what do we mean by that? My book discusses uh, what the investigators found out, what it did to them in a counter-transfer sort of way, and why this work has been locked up and hidden in the archives. I should add, as an aside, this is partially a tale of the University of California. And you'll see these peculiar little links between UCLA, Santa Cruz, San Francisco, and uh, Berkeley, which I'll come back to. I'm a child of a certain age, and so when I remember the who, uh, some of you won't. But, uh, you know, Peter Townsend s stated the problem lyrically. Uh, no one knows what it's like to be the bad man, to be the sad man behind blue eyes. No one knows what it's like to be hated, to be fated, uh, to tell the only lies. But my dreams, they aren't as empty as my conscience seems to be. So how could the war criminals do what they did. What possessed them? Were they suffering from a psychiatric disorder? Keep in mind, these were in the days prior to DSM not. There was no DSM. When I started out in psychiatry, I actually started the DSM. There was no suffix. It was a little ring-bound uh, folder. But in the 40s, there was absolutely nothing in the way of a consensually shared view of the nature of psychopathology. It's important to acknowledge that the Nazi concentration camps um, really conveyed a certain sense of familiarity with all of our Western heritage in art about our conceptions of hell um, dating back to the 16th century. This was not an isolated phenomenon. The, uh, many people were swept up in the genocide of, uh, of Nazi Europe. And the dots on this map are not merely uh, uh, city uh, uh, markers, but each of the dots is a concentration camp. Uh, there were over 40,000 concentration camps in the Greater Riot uh, at, uh, during the, the war. 
It was a vast industry of death. There would be retribution for these crimes, and for a time the Allies couldn't agree about what to do uh, uh, with war criminals or what the process should consist of. Thus, initially, most of the war criminals were detained at the Palace Hotel, a luxury spa in Mondorf, Luxembourg, codenamed Ashcan. Security was so tight that in order to gain access, you needed a pass from God and someone to vouch for his signature. The uh, war criminals posed for photographs on the veranda of the hotel and were nicknamed the class of 1945. John Kenneth Galbraith, who happened to be on the scene, sensed the drama looming in the background behind these walls. And he wrote, suppose someone had written a play and put all these characters on the stage where the curtain went up, the playbill would have read, a jail in Luxembourg in June 1945. While the Nazis posed on the veranda at Ashkem, the Allies debated if and how and where a war crimes trial should be. They selected Nuremberg, a city totally devastated uh, uh, in the war, but oddly enough, the courthouse and the prison uh, remain. Many people ask how I got involved in this. I've spent uh, all of my life uh, doing research. Uh, I was uh, at Mass General, this was 40 plus years ago, uh, as a junior faculty member, I don't know whether it is this way at UCLA, but at Harvard, of course, the junior faculty were assigned the lousiest office space uh, anywhere. So this quaint old building uh, was isolated. I was basically the only person there. Uh, I got a knock on my door uh, in my office. I, I was in the attic window, circled uh, on the photograph. Uh, and I was startled because I wasn't expecting anyone uh, at the time. The stocky man walked in and uh, said without preamble, are you Dimsdale? And I said, yes. And he said, I am the executioner, and I've come for you. He pushed his way into my office. He was carrying a gun case, sat on my couch, opened the gun case, and out popped documents. What he told me was he was the Nuremberg executioner. And said, Dimsdale, you've got to stop studying the victims. Someone has to start studying the perpetrators. As I said, this was many years ago. Um, uh, I was rather shaken by this uh, experience. And how could I possibly start doing this, uh, running a lab? Did I even want to do this? Could I interview the dead? And when I retired a few, uh, a few years back, I discovered the power of archives. And uh, it, it's amazing what one can learn uh, on archives. They are, uh, it's like antiques uh, uh, road, roadhouse, roadshow. And you, you just don't know what's going to be in an archive. Nor does the librarian. The librarian's only job is to guard it from being stolen. Um, so you go to odd places, predictable places like Washington, um, unpredictable places like Akron, Ohio, Gainesville. And it gets to be uh, uh, quite interesting. So my work focuses on the orchestrators of the Holocaust, not the perpetrators per se. I wanted to study people who could least well argue that they were merely following uh, orders. One of my first trips was to the Library of Congress, where I encountered uh, this telegram 
Um, uh, the younger people, have any of you seen it tell it there? It was an interesting uh, uh, telegram, an unusual telegram from Harvard criminologist Sheldon Fluck. Uh, uh, and basically, what he suggested that it was important to have a pretrial examination of the war criminals by psychiatrists, psychologists, and anthropologists. And he added that he wanted that uh, these people should be knowledgeable about the war shock. There were actually many uh, le such letters uh, in the file. Uh, and um, the, oddly enough, psychiatry and psychology were absolutely deeply involved in the trial, in the jail, but not so much in the courtroom, per se. So the, uh, there was a peculiar uh, coalition of medical societies that lobbied uh, Justice Jackson uh, and the Nuremberg authorities to start looking at the war criminals. And basically, they argued for three things. Study the war criminals, give them war shocks, and study their brain. And they added, if and when the accused has been convicted and sentenced to death, it would be desirable to have a detailed autopsy, especially of the brain. Therefore, it is urged that the convicted be shot in the chest, not in the head. So we go back a century to Herman Rorschach. Um, this is a picture of him in 1920. Um, looks like Brad Pitt. Um, uh, Rorschach was a fascinating guy. Um, uh, lots of interests, uh, passionate about the arts, kind of couldn't decide whether he wanted to be an artist or a psychoanalyst. He went back and forth and basically <coughs> did them both. And as a result, um, he didn't get a lot of respect. Um, he didn't publish much. Uh, his epidemic workshop test was rejected constantly everywhere. And finally, he got it accepted for publication one year before he died. He died, as, unfortunately, as a very young man. Um, how many of you have ever taken or seen a live workshop? <coughs> That's more than I expected. Most, uh, most of the time, we get our ideas about a war shock from movies. Uh, uh, but in, back in 1940, this was a very powerful and widespread used uh, test. Uh, yes. Basically, in administering a war shock, uh, the uh, interviewer uh, uh, asks two questions uh, about each of the ten cards. It's a powerful test, but it, uh, the, the interviewer and the coder is not necessarily focusing as much on the content of the workshop as much as what aspects of the block you're responding to. Are you responding to shading, color? Are you synthesizing the whole block or just looking at a, a piece of it? Um, the, uh, as you might expect, questions about reliability and validity um, of the Rorschach uh, remain. Curiously, the reliability issue has been solved. The validity issue remains up for grabs, uh, I would say. So who are these people? The assumption is that these defendants were depraved monsters, psychopaths. What does that mean? How do you prove it? They were a very heterogeneous group of cabinet ministers. Most of them couldn't stand each other's guts, not unlike contemporary cabinets. <laughs> um, uh, uh, one of them, Julius Stryker, was so objectionable that he had been put under house arrest by his fellow cabinet ministers, and he had spent from 1939 until his capture, he was under house arrest. So it was a very heterogeneous group. 
Um, uh, and we'll go into that. I, I'd like to talk with you about a couple of the war criminals, but I'd like to introduce you to uh, Douglas Kelly and Gustav Gilbert. They were the psychiatrists, psychologists on the spot at Nuremberg. Their tasks were to determine fitness for trial, a logical, familiar aspect of any forensic psychiatrist. They were supposed to maintain prisoners' morale in an unusual sort of thing, given this was a military wartime situation. Confidentiality was non-existent, and so they were in constant contact with the prosecution uh, office about what they were learning. But they also had their own personal agenda. They, um, they were aggressive, very bright young guys, and they wanted to stake out for themselves a research question and to build their own careers on answering this question about the nature of psychopathology. I'd like to start by talking about Robert Ley. Robert Ley was the head of the German labor front. Uh, he uh, suppressed labor unions, executed labor uh, union leaders, authorized numerous war crimes. He had a history of multiple head injuries and episodes of unconsciousness. Indeed, after one of these, he had a persistent stammer for the rest of his life, perhaps an expressive aphasia. He uh, was a plane crash survivor, severe alcoholic. Um, uh, the uh, psychiatrist Douglas Kelly evaluated Lay in October 1945, and he writes in the familiar cadence of a, of a mental status exam, normal psychomotor relations, reactions, and normal attitudes and behavior. Mood is normal, but affect is extremely labile. Rorschach reveals emotional instability and evidence of frontal lobe damage. He is one of the most potentially suicidal prisoners due to his extreme instability, secondary to his old head injury. Lay hanged himself the next day. Um, and Kelly wrote sardonically in his journal, since Lay kindly made his brain available for post-mortem examination, we were presented with the rare chance to verify our clinical and research findings. There's a great deal of popular interest in finally getting hands on a Nazi leader's brain. Um, the uh, uh, Life magazine ran a story showing uh, Webb Haymaker, uh, the, the most prominent neuropathologist of the time, dissecting Lay's brain. And Haymaker reported long-standing degenerative processes in the frontal lobe consistent with chronic encephalopathy. This went back and forth multiple interpretations. The brain flew out to Walter Reed, um, uh, and then the brain uh, went to Langley Porter. Uh, and uh, there was back and forth. Um, you know, we sometimes in psychiatry uh, unnecessarily badmouth ourselves about the reliability and the consistency of our diagnoses. Well, the neuropathologist had a Dickens of the time uh, with, with this. The irony was that Robert Lay clearly had some degree of, uh, of brain abnormalities, but he was the one man who, in the dock, who expressed remorse. He killed himself out of guilt and depression for what he had done. So lest we run into this assumption that a bad brain, impulsive, etc. He had a bad brain and he did have a conscience. I'd like to move on to uh, discuss Herman Goering and his interactions with Kelly and Gilbert. Goering arrived in prison with 49 suitcases and loads of jewelry, <laughs> notably long, large rings, and all of Germany's paracodine supply. Um, Goering was an addict. Um, 
Kelly spent a considerable amount of time um, with Gurry, and you start to get a glimpse of Kelly as a diagnostician uh, and as an astute pragmatic clinician. Gurry, Kelly writes, Gurry started complaining of withdrawal symptoms. Gurry was very proud. I suggested to him that while weaker men like Ribbentrop, whom he loathed, would perhaps require doses of medicine, should they ever be withdrawn from a drug habit, he, Goering, being strong and forceful, would require nothing. Goering agreed and cooperated wholeheartedly. Um, Goering weighed 280 pounds um, on capture. He was shorter than I am. Um, and Kelly was worried about his heart. Uh, and uh, so to get Goering to lose weight, he appealed to Goering's narcissism. When I pointed out that he would make a better appearance in court should he lose some weight, he agreed and lost 60 pounds in five months of diet. Goering killed himself the night before he was to be executed um, with cyanide, and we'll come back to that uh, because that has an unusual um, tale and story that brings us back to University of California. Another person I talk about in my book is Julia Stryker. Uh, he was the editor of a very prominent pornographic anti-Semitic uh, newspaper. He urged his followers to beat up his political point opponents and accuse his competitors in the Nazi party of sexual inadequacy. I'm not talking about any recent political situations that we may or may not have observed in the United States. I'm just reporting what Stryker did in the 30s. Um, Goering could be, uh, well, Goering could be affable when he chose to be. No one found Stryker affable. Indeed, as I mentioned, he was so loathsome that his fellow Nazis locked him up. Probably the, the most problematic defendant was Rudolf Hess, um, the deputy Fuhrer. He complained of amnesia and numerous <clears throat> somatic uh, ailments. He was intermittently suspicious and saved samples of his food to prove he was being poisoned. The envelope with the red sealing wax I recovered from a basement in Silver Springs, Maryland. Again, the, the once you have a passion for looking for historical documents, you don't have no idea where things will, will come up. Uh, uh, when Hess got to Nuremberg, he insisted that um, the, um, uh, food, his food that he had saved in his envelope be analyzed by the Swiss, and uh, they basically came back and said it was flour and baking soda, uh, uh, constitutes uh, uh, any normal biscuit. Uh, but he wrote in his own uh, handwriting that this was corrosive brain and acid. Um, both Kelly and Gilbert described him as being preoccupied, withdrawn, and uh, suspicious. So I, I'd like to spend a little bit of time with our former colleagues, Douglas Kelly. Psychiatrist Kelly was one of Terman's um, uh, awardees. He was a Terman graduate, the top one half percent of the youth of California. Um, he was a Columbia graduate uh, uh, with uh, expertise in forensic psychiatry, personality, and the war shock. He came from a kind of a blue blood background in California. His forebears um, had been in law, judges, um, he was from the Truckee, and matter of fact, I think it was, I can't remember how many generations back, they had been involved in the rescue of the Donner Party. Um, <laughs> Kelly's relationship with um, Gurry was very intense and close. Many people say too close. Kelly wrote, Gurry was one of the easiest to get along with. Each day when I came to his cell, he would jump up from his chair, greet me, and with a broad smile and an outstretched and escort me to his cot and tap the middle of his cot with his great paw. Good morning, doctor. I'm so glad you've come to see me. Please sit down, doctor. Sit here next to me. 
Then he would ease his own great body down beside me, ready to answer my questions. He was charming when he chose to be, had excellent intelligence, keen imagination, great drive, and sense of humor. The two spent hours, you know, by Kelly's report, 80 hours, discussing politics, history, uh, what, what happened in the war. During, in turn, regarded Kelly as a fixer. Um, and Kelly agreed to intercede with Wild Bill Donovan, uh, the soon to be head of uh, uh, CIA, on Goering's behalf. And Kelly actually personally delivered letters to Goering's wife. Goering writes his wife, today I can send you a letter direct. Major Kelly, the doctor who is treating me and who has my fullest confidence, is bringing it to you. You can also talk to him freely. In gratitude, Goering offers Kelly one of his enormous rings, and Kelly declined. Then Goering responded, then I'll give you something even better and more valuable, a signed photograph of me. <laughs> <laughs> Gustav Gilbert, on the far right, was an American psychologist from a very different background. He was raised in poverty, uh, was sent off to orphanages. He came from an Austrian Jewish family. Um, and for him and his writing, one senses the uh, personal wound, the personal hatred of dealing with the uh, war criminals. Kelly was just trying to get them to trial and was intellectually curious about them. Kelly regarded them as specimens. Gilbert, this, there was no dispassionate belief. Uh, Gilbert wanted them dead. Um, Gilbert was also a, psych a Columbia uh, graduate with particular interest in social psychology. He knew nothing about war shocks, but he was very, he was fluent in German. So this became one of the most uncomfortable fraught collaborations in the history of medicine. I always tell my, my mentees, be careful who you collaborate with. Um, a collaboration is like a marriage. Um, it can be joyful like a good marriage. It can be terrible, filled with stalking and lawyers. And that, alas, was the problem um, between Kelly and Gilbert. Um, uh, Gilbert uh, talks about his uh, interchanges with Stryker. And you get a sense for his personal response. Gilbert to Stryker, why did you have to print all that sexual filth about the Jews? Stryker, why it's all in the Talmud. The Jews are a circumcised race. Didn't Joseph commit race pollution with Pharaoh's daughter? The judges are crucifying me now. I can tell three of the judges are Jews. Gilbert, how can you tell? Stryker, I can recognize blood. Three of them get uncomfortable whenever I look at them. I can tell I've been studying race for 20 years. Gilbert goes home and writes in his diary that night, a quarter of an hour with this perverted mind is about all I can stand at any one moment. <clears throat> Kelly designed the testing protocol. It was never used in evidence. And the criminals actually enjoyed this. It, it broke up the tedium of their imprisonment. And they bragged about their IQ scores, kind of like kids do uh, about SAT scores. Uh, after the war, uh, Kelly assumed prominent editorial positions and became a professor at Berkeley. Uh, and in his famous uh, 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 book, he concludes that Nazism is a sociocultural disease and that he had 22 flasks to study in pure culture. Well, it's time to practice with the worship. Um, uh, what do you see here? I'm not going to call it that, but what do you see here? And what makes you say that? Take a moment and think, and let me tell you what some of the war criminals reported. Hans Frisch of the Propaganda Ministry says, two dancing bears, or gnomes, or dwarfs, makes a revolting impression, not at all friendly, 
the bloody color makes me feel uncomfortable. Robert Lay, who we met before, said, a butterfly, there are colors here, black and red and white, and many perseverates. Black and red and white, a stork, a goose, it looks like it was tipped over with its legs pulled up, jaws of a butterfly. Herman Goring laughs and says, there are two dancing figures, very clear, shoulder here, face there. Top red is the head and half the face is partly white. Rudolf Hess speaks bizarrely. Uh, parts of an insect with blood spots, mass of the island savage. The opening is the mouth, it's devilish. That's why the eyes and beard are red. I don't know what's going on with the color on the slide, so. so Kelly and Gilbert had some similar perspectives. Their first uh, uh, perspectives were similar, that this was a group that was sane as a group. But their third conclusions were very different. Uh, Kelly basically said these are ordinary people, influenced by mendacity and bureaucracy, creatures of their environment. Uh, they had overweening, overweening ambition low ethical standards, and a strongly developed nationalism. Gilbert countered and said these were ruthlessly aggressive personalities, camouflaged by disarming amiability. They were cyclophymic narcissists. There were strange things going on in the prison and in the courtroom. Um, very peculiar interactions between Kelly and Gilbert. Um, um, when um, Kelly leaves Nuremberg during weeks and asks Kelly to adopt his daughter, um, Kelly declined uh, to do that. Um, there were um, there was this conflict between Kelly and Gilbert, and neither of them published the Rorschachs for years and years and years. Uh, and no one would touch it, because no one wanted to get mired. The last thing you want to do is to be in an argument with, with two colleagues who hate each other's guts. Uh, the, um, and there was also a certain sense of malaise when people started looking at the Rorschachs because they weren't showing what people wanted to believe and thought would reflect reality in 1945. Molly Harrower said, uh, we espouse the concept of evil which dealt in black and white. Our concept of evil was such that it must be a tangible, historical element on psychological tests. Molly Harrower, um, very, do you know Molly? You? She, made, she came to, to MGH once, but um, she was a, a delightful person, now forgotten uh, Rorschach expert. Um, she was the only person who was at a common friendship with Kelly and Gilbert, and she kept trying constantly to get them to work together. <coughs> She invited experts from all over the world um, uh, uh, to come to a, uh, uh, a conference, and she set the Rorschach protocols out, um, including uh, Margaret Singer got, got some um, in, uh, in Berkeley. Uh, uh, sent these all over the world, agreed to pay their way to come to a conference in London. Imagine if you got a letter from the world's Eminent Rorschach leader saying, You are a top leader. I'd like you to address the most important question of the time. Would you come? I'll pay your way. We'll go over this together. No one agreed. They all had pressing commitments um, to the time. She tried again. She tried to get a publishing venture uh, to get uh, 
And uh, uh, the, uh, she asked Gustav Gilbert to write, and Gilbert was impatient with the slow review time and surreptitiously submitted his chapter to another journal without telling Molly. Unfortunately, the new journal editor picked Molly as the blind reviewer. <laughs> so um, this was a, a problematic uh, issue. Um, and Molly basically uh, uh, wondered. Gilbert's uh, Rorschach's didn't appear until 1975, and the interpretation was so odd that Molly basically didn't believe it. So I have some sad news on Douglas Kelly. Uh, he killed himself on New Year's Day in 1958 in front of his family. When I say in front of his family, in front of his parents, his wife, and his children. Uh, he was cooking a New Year's dinner, uh, got in a quarrel, went to a study, came out and said, I think I've killed myself, and died a minute later. Uh, Kelly's study was filled with chemicals, medications, Nazi memorabilia. Uh, the, uh, whatever else was noteworthy, his method of, of, kill, of suicide got everyone's attention. It was cyanide, and uh, uh, apparently brought that to Germany. So there were questions about who gave whom uh, the cyanide in terms of Kelly uh, and Goering. Those are questions that are never going to be uh, answered. As I said, Gilbert's uh, workshops, and I will try to speed up, um, include in five minutes so we can have a chance to chat. Um, Gilbert described them as very homogeneous, savage, uh, protocols. But Molly Harrower didn't buy it. She said, these were very heterogeneous people. How could you say they were homogeneous? Um, and so she called for dry testing. So she was able to uh, get the Rorschach protocols, snipped off the identification, juggle the death with psychiatric outpatients and uh, unitarian ministers, <laughs> and sent them out um, to leading Rorschach experts and um, basically asked them to uh, uh, report their findings. And basically, the Rorschach experts were not able to delineate the war criminals as a class as distinct from Unitarian ministers in the psychiatric outpatient. So, um, how do we understand malice? Part of Gilbert and Kelly's antagonism was that they had a profoundly different view of the underpinning nature of human behavior. Uh, Gilbert believed that the Nazis were quite simply monsters, or in the word of the day, psychopaths. Um, that they were manipulative, impulsive, callous, lacking empathy or remorse, in the sense that psychopaths are regarded as other. Curiously, there's always been a suspicion that the brain of psychopaths <clears throat> is different. They don't learn well from their life experience. They don't respond to stressors in the psychophysiology lab in the way that uh, others do. Uh, and there are uh, uh, contemporary sorts of observations of, uh, 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 of psychopaths in prison in standing, which suggest perhaps there is some difference. Um, but Kelly didn't view this. If Gilbert viewed psychopathology, Kelly viewed, uh, was valued in social psychology. He believed that the social circumstances swayed people to malice. There are other traditions. Um, there's a legal or forensic view that basically says you did something, you pay for it, there's recompense. There are religious views about the nature of evil. And the darkest view of all is uh, from 
uh, Greek philosopher Bias, who said basically most men are bad. So uh, actually, Freud said a similar thing. He said most men are trapped uh, in one of his uh, letters. Uh, so what is the default position of humanity? So I'd like to conclude. Um, gosh, what is the burden of proof on all this? Um, 22 Rorschach protocols tested in people, awaiting execution, <coughs> solitary confinement, um, sitting on a cot next to your patient for a year because there was no other room in the cell. There are lots of things about this that raise questions. And yet, there is nothing like this in all the ensuing genocides, in all the ensuing uh, uh, pain trials. There is nothing like this. Yes, psychiatry has been there in the international court, but the, the, but the task of psychiatry was a narrow question. Is he or she able to understand that he's uh, on trial? No one has ever done this before. So I'd like to conclude in Santa Cruz, since I promised another UC campus, um, I was on another quest for answers. What is it about this topic that leads to archives in such improbable places? This time I was back home in California, walking through the redwood trees that stand like sentinels around the library at UC Santa Cruz. A subdued light filtered through the moist early morning air and the groves of redwoods were filled with the scent of the trees and the cause of the stellar's days. I had come to the library in the hopes of learning more about malice. For unclear records, its archives contained papers of bloodless Kelly. The files were useful in revealing more information about Kelly, magician, astronomer, television producer, but included few new documents pertinent to Nuremberg. I was, of course, disappointed, but then I started to reflect. Would any archives have answered my questions about malice? The Bible says pointedly, the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. The poet Pablo Neruda concludes more hopefully, the earth is a bed, blooming for love, yet soiled in blood. Kelly found some darkness in every person. Gilbert found a unique darkness in some. They were both right. Thank you. <laughs> if there are questions, I can try. Uh, Exactly what they asked the prisoners. Where do we have 
Catholic group and a uh, Christian camp. And part of the problem is that back in 1945, there was no, um, yeah, this, this came out most vividly uh, in the case of Tess. Tess was psychiatrically hospitalized in Great Britain for four years. I had a psychiatric record. Um, four years of psychiatry notes. Um, and the, the thing is, what you can learn is limited because words shapeshift over time. And our idea of what schizophrenia is has changed. And whether you use that term the same as I has changed enormously. So I think DSM has allowed us a certain amount of uh, uh, reliability and agreeing about what are the key features of a psychiatric illness. What else would I do differently? Well, there's already a blossoming field of neural law, for better or worse. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, this is coming up all the time where, where people are uh, having MRIs uh, and the arguments are brought forth. There's actually a study of judges. It's not just docs who get together in national meetings. Judges get together and party in Las Vegas. So they went to Las Vegas and they presented uh, a video uh, um, and, uh, about a guy who robs a liquor store impulsively and uh, shoots, uh, shoots the clerk. Uh, and uh, the question was, um, how does expert testimony affect the sentencing that the judge applies? And one of the, and so they have three conditions, just the way it was presented, number one. Number two, a neural law perspective um, that said the person has these abnormalities. And number three, um, a hard line psychopathology perspective that said basically this guy was never good and he never will be good. And so the question was, how many years would a judge throw the guy in jail for? And um, the neutral judge sends the guy up for five years. The psychopath judge sends him up for eight years. And the neuro law judge sends him up for seven and a half years. Um, I, but the, the general, Gestalt, you can find this in science. If any of you are interested, I'll dig it out for you. So I, I think I think today one would be looking, trying to understand if there were, were aspects of brain that was influencing behavior in a discernible manner. Uh, about the tests, well, uh, again, getting into the DSM fights um, and personality disorder. Those of you who followed that closely know how difficult it is to reach consensus about uh, uh, diagnosing uh, such phenomena. So I, I would suspect that those are the sorts of things that would be going on today. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. We're going to have to stop the questions for now. But if anybody has questions, I'd like you to come up and talk to Dr. Thank you again for being here.